FSU had one of the better offenses in the country last season. They would finish the season ranked as the 14th best unit according to F+, but there were moments where this offense looked a bit lost. Nowhere was that more obvious than their game against NC State. The Wolfpack were the only team to limit FSU to under 20 points on the season. So let's dive into how they did that, and more importantly, whether or not it's a blueprint that could haunt the Knolls going into 2024. Let's start with each team's game plan. Irregardless of whether NC State was in man or zone, their corners like to be in this catch alignment, where these corners are going to sit about 8 to 15 yards and be ready to break on anything short. Despite seeming like off coverage, this catch coverage can be pretty vulnerable to deep balls. In order to be ready to break on shorter routes, they often have to be a bit flat footed. That allowed FSU to get behind them on a few shots to manufacture a bit of offense. But I think the real story to this game happened in the trenches. Up front, they play with three down linemen, usually in what's called a tight front, which jams up the interior run gaps and keeps their elite linebackers clean from offensive linemen. In order to answer to that, FSU wanted to go to gap runs, which in this context will be any run with a pulling lineman. This is the family that their bread and butter counterplay is in. You can see early that they were testing different pulling combinations with this front. The first play from scrimmage, they pulled the center and the tackle. And on the second play, they pulled a play side guard instead of the center. But these plays weren't working for FSU, and a lot of that had to do with NC State's dominance of the line of scrimmage. On every one of these plays, a defender is able to get early penetration and blow up the run before it can get started. They could also manufacture this penetration. Here, this middle linebacker blitz hits a vacated gap from the pulling guard to stifle this gap run. So how did FSU respond to all this? Well, the natural answer if you're getting beat by over-aggressive defensive linemen is to go to zone running plays. And in FSU's case, they went to outside zone. What's nice about outside zone is that it's a play that's meant to go horizontal, so they can use a defensive lineman's movement against them. If they want to go upfield, then you can just ride them upfield, which opens up cutback lanes. They also read the backside. NC State was insistent on shutting down the run, which meant that these linebackers played very aggressively towards their gap. Here JT sees this inward action and pulls it to get a big gain. Later in the quarter, they go back to this play in the red zone. JT's pull earlier freezes this linebacker, and that opens up the cutback lane for Toa Philly to squeeze through for a touchdown. However, this success wouldn't last. FSU tried to go back to outside zone in the second half, but ultimately, NC State just could be patient with their linebackers and trust that their dominance along the line could stop the run game. Occasionally, JT could get something cooking by pulling it despite not getting a clean pull read, but he didn't do this often. FSU tried to get around this by stretching these linebackers away from the box through screens and short passes, but honestly these backers were good enough to be in both places at once, and since the secondary was waiting to break on shorter routes, they could really help limit these plays. What this means is that NC State effectively shut down any FSU attempt to consistently move the ball, and this plays out in the stats. While FSU had respectable yards per play due to their occasional explosive, they had an abysmal success rate. This made it particularly difficult to sustain any kind of long drive. So the consistent story here would be that FSU could generally get across the 50 through an explosive play or two, but they couldn't maintain the drive. When they were between NC State's 20 to 50 yard lines, FSU had an abysmal 2.89 yards per play. But it wasn't even a guarantee that they could get that far. NC State did a great job of forcing FSU into third and longs and they did a bad job of converting those. This wasn't because of bad play calls or even poor pass blocking for the most part. It was honestly because of dropped passes. FSU dropped 13% of all passes during this game, and three of those drops came on third down. And that's a big deal considering NC State was purposefully running the clock on the other side of the ball in order to limit FSU's possessions. So the big question is whether or not this is replicable. In order to answer that, we have to really understand the context of the game. FSU's offensive line was pretty beat up, which allowed NC State to dictate their terms on the back end, which was all they needed to allow their borderline elite defense to further pressure the Knolls. But even within that context, FSU managed a respectable 6.56 yards per play. That means they were able to move the ball, they just couldn't sustain drives. 
and most of that can be explained by bad drops on crucial third downs at a much higher rate than FSU experienced for the rest of the season. So that leaves me with this conclusion. I think NC State came out and beat FSU. They had a solid game plan and some of the best linebackers in the game to back that up. But also, I think if this game were to be played again, I'd probably expect a different tally in FSU's score column. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed it. I plan on talking a little bit more about FSU's defensive performance in this game in my upcoming video. So make sure to like and subscribe here and on the Knowles 247 channel so you don't miss a thing. Thanks.